title is Harmonic Analysis and Geometry of Fractals. Hey, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the major themes of harmonic analysis concerns studying singular and oscillatory integrals associated with lower dimensional manifolds of Euclidean spaces. Uh, we're going to see examples of problems of this type. There are many and varied. Uh, but a common thread is that the behavior of, of integrals like that, the analytic properties of them, uh, are connected to geometric properties of uh, the manifold in question. So, for example, uh, uh, they depend on things like dimension, uh, smoothness, and once you're uh, you, you've agreed to look at manifolds of a given dimension uh, that are smooth enough, um, a lot of things depend on the curvature of the manifold. Uh, this is a rich and active research area with uh, you know, a, a lot of directions, it's very productive. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, is there anything of this sort that we can do in one dimension, on the line? Now, um, it uh, might appear that uh, it can be done because in one dimension there are no lower dimensional submanifolds. Um, the only possibility is basically a single point and it, that's not a terribly interesting thing to study. Uh, but uh, Instead, uh, you can take a different point of view and uh, you, you can think about fractal sets of dimension between 0 and 1. There's no way that they are going to be smooth, but uh, there's still a way of making them regular in a certain way. And uh, we can think about extending the higher dimensional theory uh, to that kind of sets. So how do we do that? And in particular, uh, what's the substitute for curvature? A manifold can be smooth or it can be flat. Uh, what would that mean for fractal sets? Does it mean anything at all? Uh, and uh, turns out that there is actually an analog of curvature uh, suggested by additive combinatorics. And uh, that's something we call pseudorandomness. Uh, and what it refers to is the absence of additive structure. Basically, we want the set to behave like a random set in certain ways that can be quantified. The precise formulation depends on the problem at hand. Uh, it's different when you look at preterm arithmetic progressions, it's different when you look at other configurations. It depends on uh, what, what exactly you want to do with that. Uh, but the idea is that uh, you, want to have, you want the set uh, to have about the same amount of additive structure that a random set would have. Uh, this is a key concept in um, a lot of work on similarity type problems. In particular, we're going to be using ideas of Gowers, uh, Green Tau, that type of work. And a lot of those ideas are going to be uh, useful, uh, not necessarily in the sense that we can uh, borrow a result from additive combinatorics and apply it, uh, but you can sort of think along the same lines and a lot of the time, it's actually going to produce something in analysis. Uh, for us, uh, random, set, random sets, random fractals, are going to behave like curved hypersurfaces. And fractals that have more additive structure uh, are going to behave more like flat surfaces. Uh, this is a sort of a vague idea 
that's going to run through this talk. And we're going to see several different manifestations of that. Uh, so here's what I'm planning uh, to talk about. First, I'd like to give you some examples of the measures that we're going to work with. Uh, explain uh, examples of uh, how we apply some of the, the key concepts. And uh, I'm going to relate uh, the, those notions of curvature and randomness uh, to Fourier decay. Uh, and then I want to talk about three specific uh, research problems. These would be restriction estimates, uh, maximal estimates and differentiation theorems, and then similarity type results. The first two, restriction estimates and maximal estimates, these are uh, uh, like big areas of research in classical harmonic analysis. There's a lot of those. Uh, and we're going to try to do an analog of that uh, for fractals. Uh, the last type of problems was actually inspired by additive combinatorics. So we're going to try to do uh, something analogous to uh, similarity type results in a continuous setting. So uh, first of all, I'd like to specify a couple of things about the measures that we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm always going to assume that uh, we're working with finite, non-negative Borel measures. We, we don't want things to get too complicated. And uh, the notion of dimensionality that we're going to use is uh, we're going to say that mu obeys a ball condition uh, at dimension alpha if we have an estimate of this type for all x and for all r. B here is a ball of radius r uh, centered at x. Uh, I'm going to work with the dimension of the measures <coughs> rather than the dimension of sets most of the time. Uh, but there is a close connection to Hausdorff dimension via Frostman's lemma. Uh, namely, if, if we have a closed set, then the Hausdorff dimension of that set is the supremum of alphas for which he supports a probability measure with that condition. A couple of examples, uh, the uh, surface measure on the sphere, that, that's a d minus one dimensional measure, and obeys the ball condition accordingly. Likewise, if you take a k-dimensional submanifold of R, then you, you can take alpha equal to k, so that that's trivial. And an example of a fractal set is uh, just take the um, best known fractal out there, the middle third Cantor set, and then uh, you can construct the natural self similar measure on it. Where at the first step of the iteration, when you delete the interval in the middle, you're left with two intervals, split the weight in two, and then repeat that, and the limit of that gives you a measure on the Cantor set. And that obeys the ball condition with uh, alpha equal to log 2 over log 3. Uh, we're going to want to generalize that condition and look at measures uh, of other dimensions. And one way to construct fractals of that type is as follows. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a counter type iteration again. We start by taking the unit interval divided in n parts, take say t of them, and that's your first iteration. And then we're going to iterate the construction. Suppose that we have the j uh, iteration of the set. Uh, for each interval, we then subdivide it into n parts again, and again choose t of those, and, th and that produces uh, t to the j plus 1 intervals of the next generation. Uh, one thing I'm going to come back to in a moment is that the choices of subintervals uh, don't always have to be the same. We, we might iterate the same construction everywhere at all steps, but we do not have to do that. And then, uh, same thing that I said about the two, middle third kind of set, we, uh, we, we can uh, construct a measure 
by taking the Lebesgue measure on each finite iteration, risking it, normalizing it, and then taking the weak limit, and that converges to a probability measure on, on uh, the set we get in the limit. Now, regardless of the choice of intervals, as long as you keep the number uh, the, the same at all stages, uh, the set is going to have half of dimension given by log t over log n, and uh, you're going to have a ball condition with that value of alpha. Uh, if you now look at the Fourier analytic properties of the measure, then that's what's going to, to depend on how you choose the intervals. And this is where we start seeing the difference between uh, randomness and structure. If we always choose the same intervals, uh, as we do, for example, for, for the new Perth Cantor set, uh, then that, that's the, the type of set and the type of measure that I'm going to call structured. And uh, the free analytic behavior of those is going to be analogous in certain ways uh, to flat surfaces. On the other hand, if you take a random Cantor set, so you, you, uh, you have the same number of intervals, but you're going to choose them through some sort of a randomized procedure, then that generically is going to behave like a curved hypersurface. Okay, so uh, First, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, pointwise Fourier decay. It's as simple as possible manifestation of what I talked about with respect to how curvature corresponds to randomness and flatness corresponds to arithmetic structure. So let's look at that. Uh, we're going to define Fourier transforms of measures in, in the usual way. And then we're going to ask about pointwise decay estimates of this form with some positive exponent. Now, it's known that, uh, that there's a lot of measures that decay like this uh, on average. Uh, that's nothing special. What I want to have is pointwise decay uh, for all psi. And let's start with Multidimensional examples, if you export it on, uh, say, a hyperplane, then uh, you calculate the uh, Fourier transform, or, or you know, just write out the formula, and you find that this does not depend on the first coordinate, uh, so that there is no pointwise decay for trivial reasons. On the other hand, if you take the surface measure on the sphere, or on basically any curved hypersurface with non vanishing Gaussian curvature, then you get an estimate like this with data equal to d minus 1, and that's the best possible estimate that you can get for measures uh, sported on sets of that dimension. The, the difference, of course, is that uh, hyperplanes are flat and spheres are curved, and that translates into estimates like these. Um, so let's look at what happens for fractals. Uh, take the middle third canvas set, uh, then uh, it does not take much work to find that this does not decay pointwise. In fact, uh, you can find an explicit geometric progression where uh, the values of mu hat are constant. And you can do the same for the structured examples that I mentioned earlier, any counter iteration where, where the choices of intervals are always the same. <coughs> At the other end of the spectrum, you have something called silent measures where uh, beta, the, the exponent, uh, can be taken arbitrarily close to the dimension of the sport of the measure, and that 
uh, is basically the best possible decay uh, based on something called energy estimates. Uh, it's non trivial to construct measures of that type. The first example is due to Salem, that, that's where the name comes from. And then there's a number of other constructions. Uh, they are uh, different details, but uh, some of the ideas tend to be the same. And one thing that happens repeatedly is that these construct constructions tend to be random. Uh, the only one that's deterministic is the construction due to Kaufman. Uh, everything else is uh, <coughs> probabilistic. You either do a probabilistic uh, counter construction of uh, the form that I, I talked about earlier, that that's what, what we do in this paper, or uh, you try to randomize the construction in some other way, and then it turns out that for generic choices of various parameters, uh, you have an almost optimal decay estimate. Uh, so, in that way, uh, Fourier decay is uh, sort of a sign of uh, the measure being random. Uh, now, I want to move on to the first actual research problem, problem that I want to talk about, and uh, that's restriction estimates. So this is what these estimates look like. Uh, take a function integrable with respect to that measure, and uh, we can then define the Fourier transform of f d mu, and we're going to ask when the mapping that takes f uh, to the Fourier transform of f d mu is bounded from LQ uh, to LP, for some p and q. Uh, the constant here may depend on p and q and also on the underlying dimension. Uh, but there's a trivial case when q is uh, 1 and p is infinity, because that, that you, you just integrate, uh, you, you estimate that, that by the absolute value of f and, and you're done. Uh, the hard problem is to prove estimates like that for some <laughs> finite value of p. Uh, there's a large body of work on that in classical harmonic analysis with a lot of big names attached to it. Uh, a common thread again, is that the range of exponents in estimates like that depends on the geometrical properties of mu. So, for example, if mu is supported on a hyperplane, again, uh, there are no estimates like that with any finite p, for basically the same reasons that I mentioned earlier. For curved hypersurfaces, it depends on smoothness and, and uh, how many curvatures are non vanishing For example, there's going to be a difference between the sphere and the cone. Okay, so here's an example of a restriction estimate with q equal to 2. Suppose that we have a compactly supported probability measure on Rd, uh, so that for some alpha and beta we have the following two conditions. One is the ball condition that I stated earlier, and the other is the Fourier decay estimate. Then, for all p greater than uh, some value that depends on alpha, beta, and the ambient dimension, uh, you have a restriction estimate with L2 here, and uh, p on this side. Uh, this was first proved by Stein and Thomas in a series of, of alternating papers in the 1970s. Uh, in that case, uh, they didn't actually specify those conditions. They, they said that mu was the surface measure on the sphere. In that case, the dimension condition is obvious, and this follows from stationary phase estimates. Uh, the theorem uh, 
uh, in this form was proved by Mockenhaupt and Mises independently in 2000. The proof is similar to Stein and Thomas. Uh, the, the main contribution was the, uh, to, to change the point of view. Instead of manifolds, we're now thinking of fractals, for example. Uh, that was the non-endpoint estimate. And then the endpoint was proved by Beck and Seeger three years ago. Uh, so, so far, uh, the only thing that we used was uh, the Fourier decay of the measure that we're working with. Now, if that was uh, all you could say about it, there would be no point of talking about restriction estimates in the first place. Uh, the point is that we uh, want to get more geometric information about the measure by looking at not just Fourier transforms of mu, but also of uh, things like f d mu. So for example, if you, you can just look at uh, a little piece of mu or maybe just some aspects of it. And uh, the first place where this comes up is when you look at the range of restriction, uh, restriction exponents. Uh, so let's first look at the case of the surface measure on the sphere. And then the range of exponents in the theorem I just stated is known to be optimal. And the reason for it is geometric. You look at something called NAP example. Uh, a NAP example is uh, a function, or rather a family of functions, where you take the sphere, you cut out a little cap, say, on top of it, uh, of diameter delta, and then you, you look at what happens when delta goes to zero. Uh, and when you look at that, you get that, you, that, that restriction estimates cannot hold for uh, any range of exponents uh, or any, any range of p uh, beyond uh, what I had on the last slide. So this is where we're beginning to look at the geometry. Uh, it uses that a sphere is an actual sphere where you, know, you, you can take a little cap and cut it out and, and then that has a specific size and, and specified dimensions. Uh, and then what the, the example uses is that the sphere is curved, but as delta goes to zero, the caps become almost flat. Uh, and that becomes an obstacle to improving restriction estimates. Or another way of saying that is that the sphere is tangent to flat hyperplanes. And then the range of exponents reflects the degree of tangency. And by this, the same token, if you look at uh, manifolds like, like uh, cones or manifolds of higher order where the degree of tangency can be higher, then that produces a different range of exponents, again, basically for the same reason. Uh, all right, so what about fractal measures? A Cantor set is not a sphere. You cannot take a little cap of it and expect it to have a certain size, or, or you, you cannot expect it to be flat. But it turns out that, that, that there actually is an analog, and that's something that uh, I did a couple of years ago with, with Kyle Hambrook, my graduate student. <laughs> Uh, that, that was the basic idea of the construction, and then the, there are further refinements due to chain. Uh, the idea is that random Cantor sets uh, can contain smaller subsets of lower dimension that are arithmetic, arithmetically structured. Uh, specifically, uh, we can basically do a random Cantor construction and then we can insert in it uh, something called a generalized arithmetic progression. And if that progression is not too big, we can do that without uh, destroying the Fourier estimates. 
And then when you do that calculation and figure out the Fourier exponents, turns out that the range of exponents in Mockenhout's theorem is sharp. It, it cannot be improved. Uh, the construction draws on ideas from additive combinatorics and uh, especially from uh, work on restriction estimates for discrete sets. For example, <laughs> that there are papers by, I guess, Mockenhaupt and Tao was the first paper of that type, and, and then that there, have been, that there has been a lot of work since then. Uh, they connect restriction estimates for discrete sets um, to uh, counting solutions to additive equations in those sets. And that's an idea that we use in uh, proving the lower bounds here for, for the, the restriction estimates. But that's not the end of the story. Because we, we prove that it's possible for the exponent to be sharp for, for some sets. It, it cannot be improved in general. On the other hand, there's also a result of Chen that says that there are measures for which the exponents can be improved. So uh, those measures do not have an uh, additive structure. And uh, that's based on a construction of Kerner, where basically you have a half-dimensional measure, singular, but the convolution of it with itself is absolutely continuous. And that sort of thing uh, produces restriction estimates that are better than uh, what you get from Mockenhaupt's theorem. So uh, there's a lot in between, and th there's a good chance that that's not the end of the story, that there's probably more to learn about you know, what, what can happen in between. And a big open problem is what happens beyond L2. So far, I've only talked about restriction estimates with Q equal to 2 on the right side. But for manifolds, there's also a big research area concerning restriction estimates beyond that. So the idea is that you want to improve, you want to take uh, Q other than 2, and then can you improve uh, the, the exponent on the left side. Uh, and those estimates carry additional geometric information beyond just curvature of Fourier decay. For example, in the case of spheres, uh, there's Stein's restriction conjecture, a, a big open problem, and a lot of work uh, has been invested into proving partial results on it. Uh, that is related to Kakea type information, arrangements of sets of lines, sort of like what Ned, Ned talked about in the last lecture. Okay, so can you do that sort of thing for Cantor sets? And basically nothing is known about that. Nothing at all. We, we don't even know <coughs> what, what an, an analog of a Kakea set would be looking like. Okay, so that's restriction estimates. Uh, let's move on uh, to maximal operators and differentiation theorems. The prototype theorem here is the Hardy Littlewood maximal theorem, which says the following uh, We define the maximal operator. If f is an L1 function, uh, we define mf of x as follows. Take averages of f on balls of uh, radius x centered at x, of, of radius r centered at x. Uh, keep the x fixed and then take the supremum over all r. And that's the, the operator that we are interested in. Then we have an estimate uh, like this. Uh, we uh, usually say that m is bounded from 
founded on NP. Uh, this might be a slight abuse of terminology because this is not an actual linear operator because of the absolute value signs, but, but that's what it's called. Uh, so uh, that, that's what we have uh, for uh, averages on balls. This is true for all p greater than 1. Uh, for p equal to 1, we don't quite have this, but we have something that's very close to it. Uh, if this is not intuitive enough, then th there's a corollary that's uh, probably easier that if, to, to understand if, if the, you, you see it for the first time. Uh, if you take uh, averages uh, of f on balls centered at x, uh, without the absolute value this time, and if you take the limit as r goes to zero, so the balls zoom in on a point, uh, then uh, for almost all x you get f of x. And uh, I, I didn't say that, but that here, but, but that's, that's again for all f in L1. Um, we're going to be interested in analogs of this for singular measures. Uh, if mu is any measure on Rd, or any probability measure, we can define averages uh, and maximal operators associated with that measure in a, sim in a uh, similar way. We basically take rescaled and translated copies of mu and then we zoom in on the point in question. And then we ask about uh, the range of p for which m is bounded on lp. And uh, likewise, we can ask if there's a differentiation theorem uh, associated with uh, such measures, and, and there's a typo here because that, that should say d mu. So a, a classic result of this time uh, of this type concerns spheres again, uh, we define the spherical maximal operator. We take averages on spheres centered at a fix fixed point, and then we take the supremum over all r. And it turns out that this is bounded on Lp uh, for d greater than or equal to 2. But this time it's not for all p greater than 1, it's for all p greater than the exponent here. And that range of p is known to be optimal. Uh, this is due to Stein in dimension 3 and higher, and it's a Fourier analytic proof. Uh, for d equal to 2, uh, it was proved by Bourguin um, some time later. Uh, now, if you look at the exponent here, and if you try to uh, plug in d equal to 1, uh, you get 1 over 0, so uh, you know, uh, never mind that. Uh, in the higher dimensions, uh, there are many other results on this type of operators associated with uh, smooth lower dimensional manifolds, and again, there's a long list of names of people who worked on it. Uh, most of this work uses curvature uh, or at least the decay of mu hat. The one exception is Bourguin's paper, uh, which uses combinatorial information about intersections of families of circles. Okay, so this is what we're going to try to uh, extend to the setting of fractal sets. Uh, and uh, the result that I proved with Malabika Pramanik is the first result of that type. Uh, this is in dimension 1. Uh, let's take epsilon between 0 and 1 third. Then we can construct a probability measure sported on a set of dimension 1 minus epsilon uh, so that the maximal operator associated with that is bounded on LP for a range of P that depends on epsilon. 
also, uh, in the case when epsilon is equal to zero, uh, this statement is, is kind of trivial, uh, because Hausen convention one means that uh, it could be absolutely continuous for all we know. Uh, but we can also construct a probability measure supported on a set of Hausen dimension one, which is singular with respect to Lebe, uh, so that the maximal operator is bounded on LP for all P greater than one. Uh, P equal to one is not possible. Uh, as a consequence, we also get a differentiation theorem with the same range of exponents. Uh, these ranges of epsilon and p are not likely to be optimal. Uh, more likely it's you know, something that happens the first time you do something, you just do what you can, and then the range of the exponent is an artifact of the proof, so it's likely that, th that this can be improved. Uh, the reason why we require e to be a subset of the interval from one and from 1 to 2, as opposed to, say, 0 to 1, is that we, want, we don't want uh, a trivial solution where, where mu is the delta function centered at 0. Uh, we want to exclude that type of thing. Uh, the construction is probabilistic. We uh, don't know any deterministic examples, and that would be an interesting open question. Uh, I'm uh, not going to try to say anything about, about the proof except mention the key property of, of mu that we want. And that's a correlation condition, which basically looks a lot like uniformity conditions in additive combinatorics. <coughs> it's not uh, Fourier decay, it's not quite like those conditions, but then it looks a lot li like, like they do. Uh, we do not require Fourier decay, uh, but uh, it's not very difficult to modify the construction so that you also get Fourier decay as a byproduct. Okay, the last type of problems I want to mention is similarity type problems for fractal sets. And uh, here the prototype theorem is uh, a major result in additive combinatorics. Uh, suppose that uh, we okay, fix k an integer greater than or equal to 3, and suppose that we have a subset of integers from 1 to n of size at least delta times n. If we keep the delta fixed, and if we make n large enough depending on delta and k, then A has to contain a K term, non-trivial arithmetic progression. Uh, there's a lot of work on that. Uh, the theorem was first proved by Roth in the case when K is 3. Uh, Samaredi solved the general case. And then that there have been subsequent proofs that all introduced new ideas to the area. Uh, there are also many extensions and generalizations, including a multidimensional version, a polynomial Samaritan theorem, and much more. Uh, we want to try for a continuous analog of that. A first attempt might look something like this. If we're thinking about sets of positive density, okay, let's, let's think about sets of positive level measure. Uh, take a set uh, on the line, a subset of say 0, 1, uh, assume that it has positive uh, Lebesgue measure, and does it have to contain uh, an, a fine copy of a fixed finite set, say an arithmetic progression in this case? Uh, that turns out to be way too easy, because the, the answer is yes, and, the, and that follows immediately from the Lebesgue differentiation theorem that, that I mentioned earlier. Or, um, even easier from the Lebesgue density theorem. Uh, so we're looking for something more difficult. One question like that is provided by Erdos. Uh, same thing if A is an infinite sequence. 
For example, something like this, 2 to the minus 10. And that turns out to be horribly difficult. There are uh, counterexamples if the sequence de decays slowly enough, uh, explicit counter constructions by, say, Falconer or Bourdain, uh, but this particular case is open and that seems to be borderline. It, it will take major new ideas to solve that. So we're going to try something different. Uh, let's uh, take a finite set again, say a three-term arithmetic progression, but now let's make E uh, have dimension less than one. Does that have to contain an affine copy of A if alpha is close enough to one? Again, the, an the answer is uh, no, it's not that easy this time, but there is uh, an, a construction due to Kaleki that there's a closed set of dimension actually equal to one, but with a measure zero, that does not contain a three-term arithmetic progression. And Kaleki can actually prove quite a bit more than that. But uh, if you look at the work in some of the work in active combinatorics, uh, there's a way out because it's possible that you could get positive results if you assume some additional pseudo-randomness conditions on E. And there are, in fact, results like that in additive combinatorics, like, for example, uh, the theorem of Gri and Tau on arithmetic progressions in primes. So we're going to try for something like that. And we indeed have a theorem uh, to the effect that uh, if we add a Fourier decay assumption, uh, and if uh, the dimension is close enough to one, uh, then you do get non-trivial three-term arithmetic progressions. There's also a multi-dimensional version of that. Uh, this is something that we did more recently with our graduate student. Uh, the statement is too technical, but I just want to mention an example of what we can prove. Suppose that we fix three points in the plane. Uh, again, we have a compact set in the plane. Same conditions and, uh, as before, except that now we are in two dimensions. If the dimension is close enough to two, then we can find a similar copy of that triangle in our set. And again, uh, it's, uh, it, it is known that there's an example due to MAGA uh, saying that uh, this is not true without the Fourier decay assumption. Uh, we use ideas from additive combinatorics. We use multilinear forms, counting arithmetic progressions that, that uh, look a lot like uh, what, what people do in additive combinatorics. And we also have a decomposition of the measure into structured and random parts that looks a lot like uh, things that happen in the work of Green and Green and Tau in, on, on progressions in primes. I would like to stop here and thank you for your attention.